to the inspiration. Why don't we move to the talks? Diogo, who's going to go first? First, it's Gaetano, sir. Gaetano, take it away, then Dr. Diaz, and then, then you and Henry. Excellent. Let's take it away. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present our work that was done together with Dr. Gruenbaum, Dr. Quinones Hinojosa, and Dr. Abodiyama in front of everybody. And we'll be talking about our prospective study comparing spinal versus general anesthesia for lumbar spine surgery, looking at patient-centered outcomes like quality of life, postoperative fatigue, and cognitive dysfunction. We do not have any relevant disclosures and this talk was accepted as an oral presentation for CNS, and also the paper was accepted into Neurosurgery Red Journal. So as you may know, low back pain is the leading cause of years lost to disability worldwide, and it's constantly increasing. You can see an increase of 54% since 1990 with the aging population. And appropriately selected patients for surgery after having exhausted or conservative management, they do well, but they still report some persistent pain, functional disability, and also poor quality of life. So there is still an unmet need in back pain and in spine surgery that we need to address. And with this in mind, there have been new techniques like robotic spine surgery, minimal invasive spine surgery that have become more and more common during the past years, including also the adoption of spine surgery or under spinal anesthesia. There have been several papers looking at spine surgery and the spinal anesthesia, in particular the lumbar laminectomy and discectomy, not so much for lumbar fusion. And this paper have found that spinal anesthesia is associated with shorter anesthesia and surgical time, reduced blood loss, less postoperative nausea and vomiting, and thus reduced costs. No studies do have looked at MIS t -lift. So we looked at our series retrospectively at first of Dr. Abodiyama's cases, 20 under spinal anesthesia consecutive cases and 20 under general anesthesia. And as you can see, there were no differences in baseline characteristics between the patients, BMI, age, there were no differences also in anesthesia scales. And you can see here that when we looked at the perioperative outcomes, there is a significant reduction in total OR time, as you can see here on the right side for the spinal anesthesia group, 57 minutes less, a reduction of 27%, with a mean total OR time of 156 minutes compared to 213 from the general anesthesia group. There was also a reduction in total procedure time and also a reduction in mean intraoperative heart rate, as you can see from the table. We also looked at how do these patients do when they are in the PACU you during their first three hours? And we found a significant reduction in mean pain scores and also in max pain scores. And this was with no differences in total opioids received during the PACU stay. We also look at time to first ambulation after surgery, and you can see that the spinal anesthesia ambulates much faster after 385 minutes on average compared to 855 for the general anesthesia group. So overall, we found that also for minimally invasive transfernominal lumbar interbody fusion, spinal anesthesia has some unique advantages, including reduced postoperative pain, reduced OR time, and faster postoperative mobilization. So at this point, we started seeing these patients that had significant improvement in their back pain, but they still postoperative complained about fatigue that was long lasting, and also some problem with cognition, memory, was being defined as postoperative cognitive dysfunction, POCD. So we decided to design a prospective study to look at any potential benefits that the spinal anesthesia may have in regards of postoperative fatigue and cognitive dysfunction, because these patients, as you will see, they receive much less anesthesia medications, they are not intubated, so we would hope to have less postoperative fatigue and faster recovery as a result of that. So this study was prospective, patient undergoing lumbar spine surgery, either under spinal or general anesthesia by a single surgeon. And we established a priori outcome as postoperative fatigue bus as our primary outcome. And we calculated the power around that. And to detect at least a difference of 1.2 in the vast fatigue, which is the minimal clinical important difference, the MCID, we will need 25 patients per each arm for a total of 80 patients to get a power of 80% to detect that difference. 
So here you can see the inclusion and exclusion criteria. We included all patients that had a lumbar surgery, either with or without arthrodesis. And the exclusion criteria are the contraindication to spinal anesthesia. So history of intracranial hypertension, colic velopathy, infection at the site of needling. And the choice of anesthesia was not randomized. It was left to patient choice after proper consulting with the neurosurgeon and the anesthesia team. Here you can see our methodology. So we assess fatigue with two different scales. A fatigue bus scale that you can see here on the left side is called Christiansen. It's specific for, for, for postoperative fatigue. And you can see there has four anchors for feet, slightly tired, tired, and fatigued. And then we also use the childhood fatigue scale that asks several questions you can see here that assess different domains of fatigue, both mental and physical fatigue. For quality of life, we use the widely adopted SF12, the medical outcome study 12, the short form that asks several questions about how patients are feeling, if they are limited in any ways, how much pain they have, if they feel calm and peaceful, if they have anxiety, if stressed. Instead for cognition, we use the mini mental state examination. And all these patients were assessed both before the surgery and also one month after surgery. Here is our spinal anesthesia protocol. And you can see the patient received pre-medication with IV midazolam, and then they received isoberry pupivacaine 2.5 milliliter in the subarachnid space. And also some light sedation was achieved with DEXA and propofol during the surgery. So this study took one year from April 2020 to April 2021. We enrolled 55 patients. Five patients decided to cancel their surgery and all 50 patients that underwent surgery, they also completed the one month post of assessment. So we didn't have any loss to follow up. Here you can see the baseline characteristics. There were no statistically significant difference. You can see about age 60%, 60 years on average, and then you can see obesity or comorbidities are similar. And you can see that 11 were laminectomies and 14 were fusions in both groups. We didn't have any significant difference in length of stay, as you can see 0.6 for the spine or 0.76. And this is a reflection of our team that is doing a same day discharge for most of these patients. You can see it was either same day or next day discharge. So all cases were completed successfully and there was no need for conversion of spinal anesthesia cases to general anesthesia and there were no intraoperative CSF leaks recorded. Here you can see the pre-op baseline characteristic and there was no statistically significant difference between the groups at baseline in terms of fatigue, quality of life and cognition. So when we saw these patients back one month in surgery, you can see that we did the fatigue bus and the childhood fatigue scale, and there was a significant reduction in fatigue in the spinal anesthesia group, as you can see in both charts here, compared to the general anesthesia. The bus for the spinal was 2.9 on average, compared to 5.6 for the general, and also a reduction in the childhood fatigue scale. Obviously, you see lower values means less fatigue here. Then we also look at quality of life to see if this fatigue really reflected in better quality of life for this patient. And you can see that the physical component of the SF12 was highly statistically significant. Higher values means better quality of life. And it was slightly better also for the mental component, but did not reach statistical significance. We did not observe any differences in the mini mental state exam between the groups. And of course, the limitation of our studies are related to its non-randomized nature. And given that the anesthesia choice was left to patient preference, there is a possibility for selection bias as well as confirmation bias. Therefore, larger randomized controlled trials are needed to confirm our findings. But this represents the first prospective series comparing spinal anesthesia versus general anesthesia for lumbar spine surgery, looking at patient-centered outcomes of fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, and quality of life. All the previous studies have only looked at perioperative outcomes in terms of times and costs, but not patient-centered outcomes. And we demonstrated that in our series, spinal anesthesia was associated with some unique advantages, including less postoperative fatigue at one month and better resulting quality of life. So we, I want to acknowledge Ms. Kathleen Stander and Bill Stander for their contribution. I just want to briefly show a couple of videos that she shared with us. We didn't ask, she was very happy. And she was the first patient that participated in this prospective study and she had surgery and the spinal anesthesia with Dr. Abode. So this first video is her just the day of surgery. Anderson Stender, and I have just had a fusion with Dr. Abode. And I'm 65, so I prefer to consider having something less invasive. Now, I didn't know there was even an opportunity 
for that. I came to Mayo Clinic, Dr. Abadi said, we're going to do this fusion. The only thing you need to think about is select your music. Because I couldn't believe that I would actually be awake, partially awake during this process. My surgery took place about 13 hours ago, and I'm already walking, eating, talking to my family, all my grandchildren, and I'm so grateful that there is a procedure that puts me in a place that I'm not scared of losing my memory or a procedure that would probably inhibit my ability to be mobile because it would take a long time to recover. I own a business and I'm excited that I met this doctor and I'm at Mayo and I'm with the best nursing staff I could possibly have. Thank you for this opportunity. And that's her just 12 days from a surgery, a fusion, not just a laminectomy. Hi, I'm Kathy Anderson Stender. Just 12 days ago, I had a wonderful procedure at Mayo Clinic with Dr. Abadi. It's a minimal, minimally invasive fusion of my fourth and fifth vertebrae. So I'm really excited because I am up walking about. Although I have my trusty brace, I can do things, I feel good, and I'm excited that I was able to do this procedure. It's minimally invasive, so I wasn't generally sedated. So I can definitely recommend the procedure. I feel great. And as you can see, I'm back at doing the things I love most. Thanks. Anderson, Be Stender, and Beautiful. Thank you so much. And I want to personally thank Dr. Abodi for his guidance for this research. And I will take any questions. Well, for the interest of time, because we have two more, let's say the questions as a feedback. I already have some feedback on the slides. Let's move to the next speaker. We'll save the, the questions for people to ask you. Um, and then uh, we can review the slides as well later. When are you giving this talk, Gaetano? The 18th, sir. The 18th, on the, was on the yeah, Monday, right? 30 minutes apart. I have one at 7.30, one at 8, two different yeah. rooms. So I need gotcha. to move fast. That's right. And then and then we have, I'm going to be there actually at the scene. I don't know who else is going. And then um, also it's important to realize and, and to acknowledge that that lovely patient also made a, made a major donation to Dr. Boriyama's uh, work. So good. Go for it, Diogo. Yep. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. Today I'm going to be talking about intraoperative detection of IDH mutation and residual glioma. So as you all know, uh, gliomas have limited therapeutic options. Surgery, surgery is still the mainstay of treatment. And as we progress to ever more extensive surgical resections, the need to really understand whether or not we're dealing with invaded or non-invaded tissue at the penumbra becomes ever more important. And not only that, but it has molecular markers and in particular RDH status become not only uh, diagnostic, but prognostic factors, and in future seem to be therapeutic factors, it is important to know this sooner than what is the current status quo, which is five to 10 business days after surgery. So with this in mind, we propose to use a new technology, which is desorption electrospray ionization mass spectrometry to identify both tumor cell percentage and IDH mutation status in patients enrolled. And first of all, let me just brief you on what desorption electrospy ionization mass spectrometry is. So what you see here is the machine that a lot of you have seen outside the IMRI. And I have here a red circle that is pointing to the guest chamber in which we place smears. These smears are obtained from tissue that is obtained right from the operating room, smeared right outside. And it is then inserting this thing to this chamber. And here on the right, what you see is that a solvent is then sprayed. It absorbs ions. It almost like collects the first layer of ions at the surface while preserving the architecture of the tissue. And these are then bounced back and collected by the mass spectrometer here, which will give you the mass and the charge of each or one of those ions, which allows us to know exactly the composition of the tissue that is being presented to the mass spec. With this in mind, then we proposed two aims. One aim was, can we determine the IDH mutation status of gliomas inside the operating room? And the other one is on, these smears that we get, can we tell the surgeon how much tumor he has on each and every one of those tissue slides, which are correlated with where we collect them. They're image guided, so we know exactly where we are and we can tell the surgeon how much tumor he has. And I'm going to present to you two methods for this, which I'm going to discuss in more detail later on. I just want to briefly mention that 
we propose to capture 50 patients when we, and we have already captured 39. And on each of these patients, we try to collect eight tissue samples, eight tissue biopsies. And we have so far 271 with overall a great quality. All of these smears are then stained, sent to pathology and validated in a double blind fashion so we can know if our measurements are or not clinically valid. So without further ado, I'm just going to briefly talk about IDH mutation. As you all know, IDH stands for isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is a normal enzyme that converts isocitrate into alpha ketoglutarate. In patients with mutation, instead of producing this metabolite, it produces 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is a unique oncometabolite, which then we can detect with mass spec. And on the right, what you see here is that what you see on the x-axis is the more 2-H2 you have in the tissue, the higher the signal we capture with the mass spec. So once you insert the tissue sample into the mass spec, you get a spectrum like this. And we selected glutamate as an endogenous control because it will be present on white matter, gray matter, and glioma. So the peak 128 represents glutamate, 129, 2-hydroxyglutarate. And more important than just the peak is the relative uh, uh, intensity of each of those peaks. So in a patient without the mutation, you'll see that much more glutamate than 2-hydroxyglutarate versus in a patient with mutation, the opposite happens. And in our samples, we are so far averaging a sensitivity of 91%, specificity of 100% for a total overall accuracy of 97%, ability to detect IDH mutation inside the operating room. And the ones that in which we did not correctly diagnose were peripheral biopsies in which the tumor content was very small, and we're not certain if there was any 2-hydroxyglutarate. When it comes to uh, tumor cell percentage, I'm just going to walk you through the first set of experiments in which we based it further than detect. So we uh, used slides that were read by a neuropathologist and he identified exactly on those slides where there was gray matter, white matter and glioma. And we then on a number of days uh, studied the lipid profile to, and we understood that there were some very specific peaks that were specific to glioma peaks that were specific to white matter and then gray matter. So we introduced this into an algorithm which used this as a testing set. And then every sample we insert is the validation set and it can give us how much it thinks it has glioma, gray matter, or white matter. So with this, we are averaging 77% sensitivity, 57% specificity for a total average of 66% ability to detect how much exact tumor we have in each sample. Another method we used to corroborate is n aspartic acid. So other groups have reported that the more tumor you have, the less of this metabolite you have. So with this in mind, we use this and we are averaging out 82% sensitivity, 71 specificity for a total combined average of 75. Now, one of the questions our group asked was whether or not the results we're getting when it comes to tumor cell percentage are being influenced by the fact that at Mayo, we do see a lot of recurrent tumors, which tend to have a more disorganized structure, more fibrosis and harder to read. So we excluded the recurrence. And as you can see, we have a total of 20 primaries. And while in parenthesis, you see the total average for primary plus recurrence, on the left, you see what we get when we just look at primaries. And while for the NAA scan, we do see some improvement, but not major. For lipids, we see a major improvement when we only look at primaries with sensitivity of 81%, specificity going up from 57 to 70, for a total average going from 66 to 76. So in conclusion, we're able to detect IDH mutation inside the operating room of overall accuracy of 97%. We're able to detect tumor cell percentage with a 66% accuracy for lipid profile, 75 for NAA. And when we only look at primaries, this goes up to 76 and 81. And I'll just like to thank the entire team. It really does take a village to make these projects happen. And in particular, Dr. Q and Chichana for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. And uh, I'll take any questions. Beautiful, beautiful. For the interest of time, let's do the same. You know, you look at the slides and I think we have one more talk and we're running against the clock, but I, I'd like to make sure that you guys try to stay in time with your talks as well, which is what is gonna happen at the meeting. All righty. So Henry, you wanna, you want to take it away? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting this morning. Uh, my name is Henry Ruiz, and we are going to be 
uh, presenting a, a study that we put together thanks to the collaborations we have with Dr. Sheehan from Virginia University. So this, this, this study is entitled Complex Remeningiomas in Patients with Neurofibromatosis Type 2, a multicenter study reporting on long-term outcomes after radiosurgery. This is the list of authors and the multiple institutions that participated in this project. I have no disclosures. When we talk about neurofibromatosis type two that we are gonna to call today or this morning NF2, we know that this is an autosomal dominant syndrome which presents with multiple benign lesions with, uh, for example, bilateral vesular schwannomas, meningiomas, ependymomas, and astrocytomas. These patients with NF2 usually present with several uh, tumors at the same time and they are more prone to present with recurrence and diachronically develop new, new tumors, new lesions over time. Uh, regarding meningiomas, meningiomas are the, mo the second most common tumors in NF2 patients after vestibular, uh, vestibular schwannomas, as we know. And they present in up to 80% of patients by the age of 70 and are associated with uh, increased morbidity and up to 2.5 fold increase in mortality. And so what, what is what a meningioma represents for a patient with NF2? A meningioma means that uh, an NF2 patient is gonna have a higher intracranial and spinal tumor burden, and these patients usually gonna require a higher number of surgical procedures. That is really important when we talk about the importance of this, uh, the relevance of this study. So regarding treatment, uh, in patients with NF2 presenting with meningiomas, convex meningiomas are among the most common lesions requiring treatment because they are more common, right? So right. even when surgery and radiosurgery have been proven safe and effective for the common meningioma, the idiopathic meningioma, in the case of NF2 patients, there are some concerns uh, with the use of radiation because the specific genetic background. Uh, we know that these patients already have a, a genetic mutation, uh, usually in the Merlin protein, and also that the natural history of these uh, meningiomas uh, is different in NF2 patients. So these concerns are based in the two hit hypothesis uh, that was uh, seen before in patients with retinoblastoma. That means that if a patient has already a mutation and you give uh, this patient, for example, radiation, the risk for malignancy increase. So there are some concerns. And that's why we decided to evaluate the role of gamma knife radiosurgery as a definitive treatment for NF2 associated complexity meningiomas in regard to tumor control, malignant transformation, radiation induced adverse effects, and mortality. Regarding the study design and patient selection, this was an international multicenter retrospective study approved by the International Radiosurgery Research Foundation. The inclusion criteria, as we can see here, uh, were patients with NF2 with at least one convex meningioma, radiographic diagnosis, we didn't require pathology diagnosis, at least six months of follow up and treatment with upfront gamma knife, no other treatment before radiosurgery for the lesions that we evaluated. The radiosurgical technique was uh, already described in multiple publications, but as a general idea, all these patients receive a single fraction a session of radiosurgery and different units of gamma knife uh, were used in the different centers that participated in this study. There were seven different international medical center. The total cohort after uh, Inclusion exclusion criteria was 39 patients with neurofibromatosis type 2. 39. And I'm going to call this the total cohort. And this is the uh, selected cohort or specific cohort that uh, included only patients with convex meningiomas. They were a total of 19 neurofibromatosis type, type 2 patients presenting with 120 convex meningiomas treated with gamma knife. The clinical characteristics, uh, we saw that uh, there were more uh, females than males, 13 versus 5, 
And this is important, the age uh, diagnosis, the median age was 30 uh, years, which is around 20, uh, even 30 years younger than patients with convexity meningioma idiopathic as reported by Dr. Konsiolska. Uh, the median age at treatment was 32 years. Uh, the number of meningiomas, the median number per patient, total number of meningiomas per patient was a 13. And this patient, each, each of these patients uh, had 3.5 uh, meningiomas, convexity meningiomas receiving gamma knife as a medium. The most common symptoms were headaches and motor weakness, and 11% of patients presented with seizures. The tumor location is also important, as we can see here from the total cohort, we, we see that 200 or oh, four meningiomas received um, gamma knife. And from this 60%, that means 120, were convexity meningiomas. The, uh, also an important uh, point in this work is that the, the median follow-up time was um, very long, 15 years of follow-up. The size of the lesions were actually small and medium-sized meningiomas. Um, there was only one case of progression. It was a marginal failure happening 24 years after treatment. The radiation induced adverse effects. Uh, percentage was only 5%. Um, this patient presented with brain edema. There were no cases of malignant transformation and, the, and no mortality related to meningioma receiving treatment. This is the kaplan meier curve. And as we can see here, uh, many tumors, at least 67% uh, around of the lesions uh, had a fallout at least of um, 10 years. The overall tumor control rate was 99%. We, we see that this is adequate uh, and we expect not to be as high if we uh, run this study with a different cohort, but it's gonna be uh, probably uh, within a range that is acceptable and comparable with the rate, uh, the rates found in convexity meningiomas, uh, uh, idiopathic convexity meningiomas. Limitations, uh, all those related to a retrospective study. And as a conclusion and as a summary, 99% of tumor control rate with many tumors having a, a, a long-term follow-up no radiation induced malignancy or transformation. Brain edema um, presented only in 5% of, of the cases. And so we can say that gamma knife is safe and for long term, a tumor control in NF2 associated convexity meningiomas, which may help reduce the number of craniotomies that these patients undergo and also help to present the, the quality of life of the patients. Thank you. For Henry, let's see if we can take out the presentation. I just put something on the note. I think that I hope people realize, you know, as there are a lot of comments, I, I know they realize the extraordinary quality of the work that is going on right here. Every single one of them. The first one by Gaetano, he submitted a multi-million dollar PCORI grant. The second one, Dio, was already funded by a major multi-million dollar grant, in addition to the fact that he's actually leading two other major multi-million dollar NIH grants that were submitted right now, which we work every weekend on them. And the third one with Henry is also leading a, mo a major multi-million dollar stereotactic radio surgery grant that he's doing with me and Dan Trifiletti that we're planning, we already submitted the ones we're planning to resubmit. So all this is really at the highest level. And as a matter of fact, one of them got an award, which is the one with Diogo, which is a, got a, one of the major awards of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. So let's go systematic. Let's go to the first talk with uh, Gaetano. Any any thoughts? You know, the, the only comment that I have, Gaetano, where you show the uh, retrospective data and the uh, wake, you know, spinal versus uh, general anesthesia. One of the criticisms that someone may give, and I actually overcame that criticism in one of my own papers, is that how do you know the timeline when you look at the time of surgery between a spinal and uh, in general anesthesia? Is not that the, the the general anesthesia were the first cases that you know Dr. Aboriyama was doing when he first started, and the spinal are later. So as you get you know more proficient in your work you know, you actually get better. So the way you overcome this is very simple. You show a graph where you look at case of a case and dots over time. In red, you know, for instance, you can show a line where you look at uh, the patients that have, 
you know, general anesthesia. And in blue, for instance, you show the ones that have spinal anesthesia. And you show over time, you do a linear regression and you compare both of them. And you look at the uh, repeated measures and NOVA comparison over time. So that's the way you overcome that potential criticism. Also, at the end of the day, you're doing the randomized control trial. So it doesn't really matter, but something to consider you know, for you to have in the back of your mind. The second point is that some of the slides for all three of you guys, there may be a little too many words and you just, listening to you guys, you guys are so much more succinct. You don't have to tell them the entire story, but you want to be able to hit some of the notes so that way they don't get overwhelmed with a lot of words in your slides. So that's for all three of you guys. Any, any thoughts from anybody for, for the first talk? Where is uh, Kingsley? Kingsley, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm right here. Any any other thoughts for that? No, you remember? know, I was just about to uh, say no. That that's a really great point on the timing on uh, on the retrospective work, and you know, that that's actually one of the comments we got from the reviewers as well on that mm -hmm. paper when we submitted. Uh, so thank you for that. That's that's actually very helpful. Uh, you know, I, I thought he did. You know, Gatano is obviously a superstar, very hardworking, has been doing a great job with this. Um, you know, I thought he did a great job. You know, I, I, I kind of talked to him already. One of the things we need to do, those uh, forms, we need to find a better way to load those up so that, that they don't look, uh, they look a little bit. They kind of take down the quality of the talk a little bit. Um, but we, we'll, we'll work on that. But maybe, overall, great job, Gaetano. Maybe you find a digital form, Gaetano, if it's available, and also work with Linda and Daniel for Epic. And Ian Buchanan is leading an effort to get some new things into Epic. If these are things that are important for quality of care for patients, if they can have an impact in quality of care, it's much easier to move them onto Epic. So talk to Linda and Daniel about that possibility. I will. Thank you so much for the feedback. All right. Let's go to the second one, you know, uh, for, from Diogo. Any, any thoughts? This, this can be quite a complex topic, you know, obviously. I think that... Uh, one potential consideration is uh, people don't understand the, the movement of the tissue from when we are in the operating room to the device. So maybe having a small, short uh, 30 second movie of that process when you're talking about the methodology so people can see it in different stages as you're talking to them and the methods they understand that this is happening right there in the operating room. And one thing to consider is that we're not supplementing. We are actually extending the neuropathologist to be there in the OR. We're becoming even more multidisciplinary, live multidisciplinary. Yes, sir. Any, any thoughts from anybody else from this talk? I see Gabriel about to turn the camera. Oh, he was just, you know, he was moving his camera, you know. Yeah, that's it. Now, congratulations. Uh, good, good, uh, different kind of topics, but uh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. I deserve success for them at the CNS. Both three words, absolutely yeah. nice, good. And we got three more, Gabriel, that we're going to present. We got a total of six of platform talks. So we got three more coming up over the next few weeks. We just start with this, you know. Any other thoughts from anybody about? This one right here. Including Dr. Buitrago from Colombia. Including Dr. Buitrago from Colombia, Tito. Is he Tito here today or not? He was watching the soccer game yesterday. I think it was Brazil versus Colombia or something like that. Is that right, Diogo? Brazil, Brazil, Colombia, 0-0. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was Tito, right? Yeah. <laughs> my European or my Latin American Colombia like is like a winning Olympic medal or something like that. <laughs> you held them back. That's great. So good. All righty. And then the last topic, uh, Henry, from, from your perspective, obviously that's a, a very relevant topic. I, I would consider maybe even illustrating with a case at the beginning. Uh, one of our own patients, and we have tons of patients with neurofibromatosis, they have multiple tumors, multiple surgery, multiple resections, just get one of those, and that way you bring it home, and, and people understand the significance of this. I mean, most people do, obviously, where you're going to be, but I think it's something to consider adding to that. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else? I know that we run a, a few minutes over time, and we got to go and see our patients for surgery, but... Uh, Thanks everybody, what an amazing, we have many, many countries represented, tons of people that are still logged in, listening to you guys. So 
Congratulations to you guys on Friday. In our uh, Diogo, what's on Friday? What are we having on Friday, Diogo? We're gonna have, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to double check. I'm pretty sure we have the Sabai, whose uh, last day will be Friday, and yes. then Adrian, who's also presenting from uh, Milan. From Milan, we're excited, Adrian, and also our medical <laughs> students. So beautiful. All righty, we're looking forward to it, and thanks everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful, blessed week. Okay, great job.